committee will come to order. Before yielding to Bob Goodlatte, uh, I wanted to uh, have just two minutes further for any of you who wanted to add to the discussion we were, were in mutually in terms of exchanging ideas and views on comments made by other panelists. Mr. Chairman, I think we came to complete and total consensus. <laughs> oh, yes, right. <laughs> As, as my boy says to me, yeah, right, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Anybody want to weigh in? I'm looking at Ken because we had the best argument during the break. So That's right, but we kissed and made up. <laughs> um, I'll, uh, I'll jump in on just one point, which is uh, everybody's talked about the problem of overclassification. And... Um, I just want to address that. I agree that that is a problem. No question about it. I actually applaud the, the president for his having undertaken an effort uh, to review the classification processes in place and try to, you know, get more transparency and reduce the classification of information. Um, I guess my, my point would be this, though. That is a problem. And it's a problem in terms of the reality because it, it, it chokes off a flow of information that should go out to the public, uh, information that truly isn't sensitive. But also it's a, it's a problem of credibility because the government has less credibility when it says these are our secrets and only some fraction of them really are. But keep in mind, that's, that is one issue, and that doesn't completely solve this problem. So while, yes, we need to address that, the question I think that's out there now that's been posed by WikiLeaks is, okay, now what do we do about organizations out there whose sole purpose is to try to get secrets? So I guess my – I think of this like maybe a football team, a defensive coach on a football team it's trying hard to – it doesn't defend well against the run. Well, you don't just fix that just by going out and getting a good defensive, uh, defensive end. You also probably need a good middle linebacker. So if you look at dealing with class overclassification as your defensive end, that's fine. That helps partly. But you're also going to need a good linebacker to try to stop the run. So my point is we also need to deal with what do we do with these organizations that are kind of new out there on the scene, like WikiLeaks, that are sort of – doing their best to get our secrets and put them out there. Nothing like a sports analogy when we're in the complex matters. Well, I would like now to turn to uh, our good friend, Bob Goodlatte, who is a senior member of this committee and served with great distinction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing. I think this is a very important subject, and uh, this panel has been excellent in uh, offering us a number of uh, perspectives about this. And I, I don't know that we'll get quite the unity that Mr. Blanton claimed, but uh, I nonetheless think that there's probably increasing agreement on what are the problems and uh, what are the limited solutions that we have. I would say, first of all, that the lack of security safeguards uh, for protecting uh, classified material is stunningly poor, and uh, uh, this, is, this problem is enhanced by the use of modern technology that uh, mm -hmm. uh, spreads it around in places where I am sure many of the people who want something kept secret don't even know who is responsible for keeping the secret for them, and that's clearly the case uh, with a, uh, one member of the, the U.S. Army having access to and uh, apparently turning over hundreds of thousands of documents. Secondly, I, I second those uh, who have called for greater openness. Uh, there are, uh, without a doubt, uh, many, many things that are classified that should not be. And uh, we have a, a problem, I think, with out-of-control expansion of what uh, are being deemed secrets uh, and for reasons that are not legitimate uh, in terms of uh, somebody wanting to do a little CYA instead of uh, actually really protecting the national interests of the United States. Um, uh, finally, we want to make sure that we are that are not uh, suppressing information that that uh, should be be made public. Nonetheless, it causes great concern to me that any outside organization would be put in the position of being the arbiter of what, amongst hundreds of thousands of documents, 
uh, should be deemed secret and therefore not put up on the internet and what should not. Uh, they don't have the professional ability to do that. They don't know the far-reaching consequences that this will have on people's lives uh, or on the national interests of this country, uh, nor do I get the impression that the leaders of this organization indeed care about what are the national interests of the United States. So uh, we have to address this first and foremost by figuring out how to uh, safeguard the things that are truly secret and release the things ourselves uh, that we should be making public, should be disclosing. So uh, I guess first my question, I'll go to Mr. Weinstein first, but uh, uh, please anybody else join in. In terms of talking about uh, how we change the classification process, what can we in the Congress do legislatively? It seems to me this is primarily a function of the executive branch, but uh, it very con much concerns me that the executive branch has abused this power. And uh, we need to change it, but without uh, some standard, some measure of how these things are classified, what would you recommend that the Congress do to reassert uh, uh, our authority uh, and get the classification process brought under control? I appreciate the question, sir. Um, I guess, as you pointed out, um, the first thing to keep in mind is, is classification is within the prerogative of the executive. So the, the folks in the executive branch, the ones who decide what should be classified and what shouldn't, and it all sort of um, boils down to the executive's uh, responsibility to, to protect um, national security. Uh, that doesn't mean, however, that Congress doesn't have a role. In fact, I think we, we were talking about this on the break. I think if there's a silver lining to this issue coming up now about WikiLeaks, it's that not only might there be some um, salutary changes to the Espionage Act, and not only does it, I think, heighten people's awareness of this tension between security and, um, uh, and openness, but it also, I think, might heighten people's uh, awareness of the fact that there really is overclassification. And Congress, I think, can play uh, an important role in emphasizing how important it is to the executive branch that overclassification be um, got under, gotten under control, especially if the executive branch wants some legislation out of the Congress as it relates to the Espionage Act, let's say. Um, the President, as I said, one of his first acts, I think it was early on in the spring last year, was to set up this task force and, and issue an executive order covering overclassification. So my sense is there is a sincere effort underway. Keep in mind, however, that while there are, I think, occasionally- Let me interrupt you because I've got a limited amount of time oh, and several people might want to comment, but if you have specific ideas about things that Congress ought to do in this regard, uh, we'd welcome them. And I'd ask any other member of the panel if they, yes, Mr. Stone. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't accept this notion that this is uh, in, in the executive branch's prerogative. It seems to me that the way in which the classification system I agree that it's not, but I'm looking for practical ways to solve the problem. Okay, but I, if I don't want to argue the point. The I want, Congress, or the Congress if Congress you have a suggestion for us to take legislatively or through appropriations or whatever that would uh, help us to reassert our authority in this area, we're interested. Well, I mean, I would, I would say bet that's on a bipartisan yeah. basis. Right. I would say, for one thing, that, that legislation that provided, for instance, that no document or information may be classified unless a judgment is made that the harm of disclosure outweighs, um, that the harm of disclosure outweighs the benefits of disclosure uh, as a statutory matter that would then say that no one could be punished for, for revealing information that's misclassified uh, under that standard would go a long way to, to clarifying uh, what the classification standards are. What if, what if there seems to be some uh, willfulness uh, and deliberate intention to, to misclassify information that should be classified? Make it a crime. Okay. Congress All right. And I have two Two yes, practical sir. things, if you yes, consider sir. any amendments to the bill. First, I've already stated, which is to make sure that we distinguish among the various offenses so that the mishandling of properly classified information is included. Therefore, it is a distinguishing between the various forms of conduct. So Congress is basically telling the executive branch, you're not going to be able to prosecute people at the same level for the various kinds of offenses. But the second is to do what the case law often says be clear that there can be a defense given the intent of the potential criminal defendant for raising the fact that something was improperly classified in the first instance. All right. Anyone else? Mr. Nader? Just a couple of suggestions, uh, Congressman. Uh, one is 
years ago, I would say that the U.S. government should declassify anything it knows that the Soviets know, so that they don't keep it from the American people. And, and, and they knew a lot about what the Soviets knew. But it gets to my point that one of the major players in the whole classification issue is the Congress itself. And when the Congress allows itself to be stratified between the intelligence committees getting classified information and no one else in Congress getting it, that is a way the executive branch co-ops the congressional role and increases the arbitrary classification discretion of the executive branch. So that's something to look into. And the second is, um, is that uh, we should look back at what has been disclosed that was classified to educate ourselves, to be able to more precisely respond to your question. Because there's just so many things that have been dec declassified later or leaked that were absurd uh, to being classified. And that is a good tutorial to develop the kind of nuance that your, your question involves. Thank you. Mr. Blanton. Congress has an extraordinary track record in pushing back against overclassification. The greatest success, I'd say, in the last 15 years has been the Nazi War Crimes Act that pushed out millions of pages of documents that shouldn't have been kept secret all those years that showed how we had hired and sheltered Nazis in our own country. Congress ordered that. Congress built the interagency working group that ran it. You should apply the same standards that were in that statute to all historical records, anything more than 25 years old, which under the executive order is supposed to be treated differently. Apply the Nazi process. Put an interagency working group with some oomph behind it and with congressional oversight behind it to make it work. You could break loose that huge backlog of those old secrets. It's one of the hugest, biggest credibility problems of the current system. You could make a huge difference. You could empower the Public Interest Declassification Board that has appointees from the executive and the legislative branch to not just make recommendations for changing the system, but really even order the release. You could provide new funding for the National Declassification Center, which is out at the National Archives. Just started in May. Real good idea. They hired a career CIA employee to help oversee it, but they're facing backlogs of 400 million pages of stuff that should have been out 30 years ago. They can't even begin to get their arms around it. A little oversight there, I think, would really help. And I think, finally, to pick up on, on Ralph Nader's comment, currently the executive branch treats requests for information from Congress, only the chairs of committees are treated as constitutional requests for information. If you're a member, not a chair, your request for information is treated as if it was a freedom of information request. So join the line that I'm in, all right? I'm sorry, you've got a higher constitutional duty than I do. And you ought to have the right, all members of Congress ought to be treated the way chairs of the committees are treated today. Mr. Vladek. Just really quickly, I, I, I echo everything that Mr. Blanton just said. I would just point you to one more example of Congress taking an active role in this area, which is the Atomic Energy Act of 1954. Uh, you know, just so here, we're not talking about historical records. We're talking about, I dare say, what we would all agree are some of our most important national security secrets. And Congress did not leave it to the executive. Congress actually provided detailed statutory procedures to be followed and indeed to be punished in the breach. Thank you. Well, these are all very good discussions. Uh, one other point. The allegation has been made, and I, again, I don't know the truth of this, that WikiLeaks is an organization that has not only released the information on the Internet, but that has been engaged in the solicitation, the facilitation, maybe even the payment uh, of, I don't know, pay for information or pay to facilitate the acquisition of the information. But do any of you have any thoughts on whether uh, there is a need to change the law in this area or uh, is there adequate law right now against what uh, most people would, would agree would, would cross the line between reporting and espionage? Well, first of all, there's a lot more we need to know, uh, Congressman. Uh, I, agr I agree with that. Yeah, that we don't know. But, uh, but for example, uh, obviously, Amazon, Visa, MasterCard, with their denial of service in recent weeks of WikiLeaks, was pressured by the U.S. government. The U.S. government did not say, <coughs> cut off the New York Times or the Washington Post. And that, that, is, that is a tip of an iceberg. Uh, I appreciate that that's an issue, Mr. Nader, but yeah. it doesn't address the answer to my question, which I've already exceeded the time. Does anybody have any comments Sorry. on the issue of whether or not we need to strengthen our laws regarding uh, the kind of things that were done 
or alleged to have been done by WikiLeaks to acquire this information or any other information from the government, and I would contrast from what, from what they acquire from a corporation. But if I may, um, yes, sir, Mr. Weinstein, Speaker Lang, uh, Congress Speaker Lang, it, um, I don't know whether he, the WikiLeaks did go about trying to procure or pay for the information, but if there was any complicity between WikiLeaks and the person who actually pulled the information out of the, the government. Um, then WikiLeaks could be charged as, a, as an aider and a better or a conspirator of the leaker. That person, then WikiLeaks would not enjoy whatever additional First Amendment protections they have as a news organization. Rather, they're charged because they, as a conspirator or aider or better of the person who is a leaker. That would be an easier case to make because then they'd be charged, like the leaker and like the four other leaked defendants that have been charged by the Obama administration um, under the Espionage Act in a way that I think is much less problematic to people because it's not going to they're not going to be charged as a press organization, rather as someone who's complicit with the leaker. That's under current law, correct, Mr. Vlad? All I, was gonna, I, I agree with that. All I would add is it may not be as problematic. It would certainly be as unprecedented. Um, the Espionage Act has not previously been used, to my knowledge, to prosecute someone on an inchoate theory of liability as an aid or a better, a co-conspirator, et cetera. The text of the statute may support it. I do think we would still wade into some of the issues you've heard us describe this morning about applying this antiquated statute to this novel theory. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob Goodlin. We now turn to uh, the gentleman from Virginia, Chairman of Subcommittee on Crime, Bobby Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling uh, this hearing. Um, you know, one of the problems in passing criminal laws is there are a lot of challenges. Uh, we, if we pass a criminal law, we expect it to be challenged on its constitutionality, so we, it has to be uh, consistent with um, precedent, and we have the Pentagon Papers, which alerts us to the fact um, that anything we do in this area is going to be problematic. It's also have to, the law has to be precise. It can't be um, subjective after the fact. Well, in this case, I think it's bad enough to prosecute the conduct to be prescribed. It has to be precise. Uh, I'm inclined to think that what happened in the WikiLeaks situation ought to be illegal, um, but I think we have a uh, consensus on the panel, if nothing else, that we ought to take our time and get this thing done right. Uh, let me just ask, I'm going to just throw out a couple of issues and just ask everybody to kind of res respond to them, one of which uh, my colleague from Virginia just um, uh, talked about, and that is, uh, should it matter whether you helped to obtain the, ma the information or you got it slipped under the door, you didn't have anything to do with it in terms of your publication? And does it matter if you knew full well that it was classified? And should it make a difference that it should or should not have been classified? Uh, and second, you have, we've heard a lot about the intent to harm or whether it ac actually harms. And that's going to have a real problem with practicality in criminal law uh, because whether or not the leak actually harmed, I mean, if you did something to sabotage the Iraqi war and we started that debate, uh, there'd be a lot of people that would conclude that you did more good than harm, although obviously if you lose that debate, uh, you've committed committed a crime. And whether or not, even though it did harm, you didn't intend for it to harm. Should that be a defense? And the fact that you redacted some of it but didn't redact all of it, should that help you or not? And part of this is, from a practicality point of view, you, you're up here, you've been arrested for publishing the material, and do you get an opportunity to debate the Iraqi war before a jury? And if you win the debate, you're not guilty? If you lose the debate, you're guilty. Um, if you are lucky enough to be in one jurisdiction where they hate the Iraqi war, you're in good shape leaking the material. If you get stuck in another jurisdiction, you're in deep trouble, same crime, different jurisdictions. Um, uh, I, from just a practicality point of view, can you talk about some of these, some of these kind of issues? And I just yield the panel the balance of my time. Congressman, let me uh, give you quick uh, answers to four and hopefully start the discussion back uh, from the experience of about these cases. Theoretically, whether or not a media organization or a third party protected either by free speech or free press or petitioning the government changes the dynamic when that organization is, as you or others have said or Mr. Goodlatte has said, 
complicit in the theft or the leak on the front end. The problem, again, is the slope. Press people cajole, encourage, flatter, talk to people in the government all the time. They are actively engaged in trying to find out that which the government does not want to disclose. They are involved. They're not taking out a, a National Enquirer check of $1,000 and paying for the information. We think that's a clearer line, although under the First Amendment, I'm not sure it is. But where do you draw the line then when a journalist is doing her or his job very well and is figuring out ways to cajole somebody to say that which they are trying not to. So theoretically, I think yes, but I think practically no. I think the issue of whether the media or the third party or the protected entity knows something's classified, well, the present law doesn't make the disclosure of classified information the crime. It makes disclosure of what's called information relating to the national defense a crime. And we are now seeing with classified overclassification that the fact that it's classified may give a presumption that there's a potential danger in its release, but it's the beginning of the conversation not. And I don't think that's going to be a meaningful distinction today. When you redraw this law someday, it may be one as, again, Congressman Goodlatte was saying, how can you prevent overclassification by making sure there's a defense, for example, that if something is improperly classified. So therefore, knowledge that it's classified is not really going to be dispositive. Um, the intent is very difficult, so you're right. There shouldn't ever be a law that says whether or not the outcome was what you intended. That is, I intended to submarine the policy of Iraq, consequently I did what I did and it didn't submarine the policy, or in retrospect, it was better to do than not to. It has to be at the front end, it has to be intent. Was your intent to? Now, that is, as you know, the same in every criminal case, trying to divine a defendant's intent by whatever their direct statements or circumstantial evidence are is going to be the challenge, even in a, in a classification kind of a case. So again, somebody saying to the government, gee, I, I, should I redact? Somebody who meets in public, somebody who does things overtly as opposed to somebody who wears a disguise and is dealing in drop boxes in the middle of the park. It, you can tell the difference between what somebody's intent is by their behavior. And finally, you raised a really excellent last point. They were all excellent, but this one, as a trial lawyer, when you are divining somebody's intent and you're saying, I felt like I needed to expose the fact that there were no weapons of mass destruction, that plays differently to a jury in Alexandria, Virginia, than it might in the Washington, D.C., than it might in some other place in the country. And that's why, among other reasons, at least the presumption is so many of these cases are brought in the Eastern District of Virginia, or at least the prosecutors believe they have a more sympathetic jury. Can I just add briefly, uh, you know, Congressman, you, raised the, you also raised the specter of putting the jury in the position of deciding whether something was rightly classified or not. And I think it's important to keep in mind that if, we, if, if Congress were to add an improper classification defense into any revision of the law, you're still putting an incredibly high burden on the, def on the putative defendant um, who's taken quite a substantial risk um, if he really thinks that at the end of the day, uh, he, you know, his freedom, whether he's going to go to jail for 25, 30 years, depends on his ability to convince a jury that something was wrongly classified. So I think you know, that's, that's not a legal argument, but I do think that that puts a pretty heavy thumb on the scale of why that would not open the door to massive uh, uh, leaks by individuals who thought that things were wrongly classified. Those are pretty severe consequences to take such a long, sh a long shot on. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Co Congressman, I would just add to what uh, my colleagues have said, but I, I would, a number of them have suggested we should alter the law to uh, have an intent to injure, and this was one of your, your points. Uh, I think there's reason to believe that would open the floodgates for leakers, that uh, th there are many salutary reasons for leaking, but, but there could be considerable disagreement about what, what actually is salutary. And the current law, which has demands that you have reason to believe it could injure the United States, seems to capture behavior that we would really like to keep uh, from, from occurring, keep genuine secrets secret. Well, what, what, what secret. burden of proof would you have if somebody honestly believed that this was good for the country, although some juries would conclude it's bad for the country, others would, I mean, do you have to prove, would the prosecution have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he did not believe that what he was doing was the right thing? I'm, I'm not sure of the, an of the answer to that. Uh, 
I think it's important here again to distinguish between. So, so are we talking about a good faith exception to leaking? I, I, I think it's important to distinguish between the leaker and the publisher. The leaker can be regulated consistent with the First Amendment much more aggressively. And there I think it's sufficient to say that knowing disclosure of classified information that's properly classified is punishable. Congressman, one more thing on your last point. You know, the present statute and the glean by courts as to the intent requirement to show, as Mr. Schoenfeld pointed out, that you had a belief that it could injure, whether that's good enough. Let me tell you why it's not good enough. What does could injure mean? What if you believe there was a 1% chance that it could injure and a 99% chance that it wouldn't? Where in that slope does somebody become a felon subject to 20 years in jail? And that is difficult, especially difficult in a First Amendment context. I mean, I think, Congressman, I think, I think the short answer is you don't write one statute, you write three. Right, and that you have a, you have one statute that is focused at espionage and spying. You have one statute that is sp focused on leaking, uh, because as my colleague Professor Stone points out, you can impose higher burdens. You can you can hold government employees to a higher standard, and you have a third statute that deals with private citizens with no intent to harm the national security of the United States. Now, that statute I think is the Im is the incredibly tricky one to write, um, but no matter how it's written. I think having those categories separated out would be such a substantial improvement, and recognizing that the burden should be different in those three cases would be such a positive development as compared to the status quo that really I think you know almost anything would be beneficial. There's, there's great benefit in having a very rigorous and narrow statute to punish the publication of the information, because that puts pressure on the government to keep the secret in the first place. So they can't punish WikiLeaks because they don't have the requisite intent or they haven't caused the requisite harm. And they know that and they're serious about the, the, the secrecy. They will then take the steps necessary to keep the information secret. And in, the, in that dynamic, I think it's very important not to make it too easy for the government to try to prosecute the ultimate speaker because if they can do that, then they'll get lazy and sloppy on the question of secrecy itself. Thank you very much. Uh, Bobby Scott for uh, that uh, interesting exchange. I turn now to the dis distinguished gentleman from Iowa, Steve King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I do thank the witnesses. It's an outstanding lineup of witnesses here, and I would uh, direct my first question to Mr. Lowell. Uh, caught my attention um, in speaking about intent. And um, in this discussion that we've had, this dialogue about intent, I would be curious as to if you had separate intents um, and maybe three almost simultaneous identical acts by different entities with different intents, are they still guilty of the same crime? To put flesh on the bones, Congressman King, in my brief introductory remarks today, I said the statute, I was speaking about Section 793 specifically, could apply again first to the government employee who had the confidentiality agreement and then said something or did something that she or he should not have. Mm -hmm. And then you have the person he's doing it to. It could be a foreign policy wonk. It could be somebody else. And then you could have the reporter who, as I said, overheard the conversation and published an article. And they're all responsible for releasing the exact same information. They may be releasing it in different ways. Ironically, the last hearer is going to disclose it to the most amount of people. The first person in the confidentiality agreement is disclosing it to the least number of people. Mm -hmm. And yet, it's easier to prosecute the first, as Professor Stone mm -hmm. and others said it should be, than the last. So with intent, let's take that intent against the last three. As to the government employee, he or she knows that based on the confidentiality agreement, whatever he or she does, that it is not supposed to occur and there's very few excuses to go outside of channels to do it. If you protect whistleblowers, then putting that aside, the intent requirement is easier to prove. To the person who's not in the confidentiality agreement and is actively engaged in the exchange, as were the defendants in the so-called APAC case, that was very problematic because on Monday, White House officials or State Department officials brought them in to discuss foreign policy that they wanted them to know and then three days later, somebody at a different level 
called them on the phone and talked about the same policy that was the subject of their indictment. Their intent, therefore, could have been proved by showing that what was legal on Monday should not be illegal on Wednesday. And then finally, when you get to the point of the media, that's where all the comments of the intent requirement, depending on their complicity in the original leak, will make a big difference. So you can take the same act and have three different standards of intent and still survive, I think, under a constitutional scheme. Mr. Weinstein, your comments on that? Congressman King, I actually agree with the idea of having sort of this tripartite approach. Um, Steve Laddick and, and Abby have, have described, I think, um, narrowing the, the provision for each of these different categories is going to make a more targeted piece of legislation. Then, then let me take this to um, the injury to the United States. What does that mean, and how can that be proven? That's also another sticking point in the whole WikiLeaks um, situation. I think you've heard a little bit of that here today. The question of, okay, you know, how damaging was it? Maybe back in the first tranche that came out, out about the DOD, the DOD documents about Afghanistan, there were informants' names, et cetera, et cetera, troop movements and the like. A lot of that stuff ended up getting taken out later on. It's um, obviously a sliding scale, and when you're dealing with the First Amendment, one of the justifications, especially if you're looking to prosecute a news organization, an organization sort of in the shoes of a, of, of a, a news outlet, um, you have to look at whether you're, you're justifying the prosecution and the incursion on their press activities in order to address real harm to the, the nation. And that's one of the big issues I'm sure the department's looking at right now, going through all the things that have been released through these WikiLeaks um, disclosures and seeing what sort of identifiable pieces, identifiable pieces identifiable pieces of damaging information are in there. I don't know that I'm clear on this, and I turn to Mr. Schoenfeld. Uh, do you believe the Espionage Act should apply to a, a foreign uh, foreign defendant that's uh, operating outside the United States? I, I think it, it could and, sh and should be applied, and I think that uh, w what he's done, uh, what WikiLeaks has done, is to uh, certainly endanger, uh, as a number of ranking officials have said, endanger our forces and endanger endanger uh, allied forces, civilians in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, the, the idea that we, the United States has no recourse in the face of this uh, seems to me unacceptable. And I think looking at the law, this is whoever discloses. And while you have the microphone uh, and for the record again, I'd appreciate it if you could just summarize those five points that you made in the, the closing part of your opening statement. Well, if I might take the liberty of looking at them. Uh, <laughs> More attention to declassification, Cert, uh, attention to giving legitimate whistleblowers viable avenues other than the media to, to which they can turn, reestablishing deterrence of leakers in the government so that those who leak have the reason to fear that they'll be prosecuted, bringing down uh, the weight of public opinion against uh, Leakers, certainly, and against those who publish vital secrets, not just ordinary kinds of secrets that are the daily fare of our of American journalism. And in some extraordinary cases, prosecution of media outlets that publish secrets which endanger the public. And I, I would think, I mean, the classic case that has been mentioned here is the Chicago Tribune case from uh -huh. Midway, but there are other cases that have approached that line in more recent years. The Pentagon Papers case, the documents that Daniel Ellsberg turned over to, to, to the New York Times were historical in nature. There was not a single document in that collection that was less than three years old. Some of the material that, say, been published by the New York Times in the last year since 9-11 have been operational, ongoing intelligence programs, like the SWIFT ma monitoring program. That seems to skirt the line. I ride the New York City subways, and so do millions of others, and there are people out there determined to bomb those. And this is a program designed to stop those people that was compromised. I think that's you know the seriousness of that, and I think the irresponsibility of, of journalism in some cases has been extraordinary in this period, much, much different from the, from the kinds of things that the Times published uh, in 1971. Would you care to speculate on their motive for releasing information that's viewed as classified? Well, in the, there were two really substantial leaks in, the, in that period. Uh, the first was the NSA uh, warrantless wiretapping program, and there the Times had an argument that this was a you know, violation of the FISA Act, and they wanted to bring it to a public station. I think there's legitimate debate about that, uh, and uh, they, would, they believe in their, I think that they performed a public service. When we come to the SWIFT, the SWIFT program, they had been warned by ranking officials, Democrats, the 
Republicans, I mean, Lee Hamilton, one of the co-chairmen of the 9-11 Commission, not to publish this material, and they went ahead. And I don't think they've offered a very uh, convincing justification for doing so. Uh, one of the reporters, uh, Eric Lichtblau, said that the story was above all else, and this is a quote, an interesting yarn, above all else. Now, for, such a, for a step of such gravity, uh, I think one can't imagine a more trivial rationale. That answer says selling newspapers. Uh, gentlemen, my, my clock went red a while back, but I appreciate all your testimony and I yield back. I'm pleased to recognize the distinguished gentle lady from Houston, Texas, a, uh, a very active member of the committee, Sheila Jackson Lee. Chairman, let me thank you very much, and I don't want to be presumptuous to suggest that this may be uh, the last hearing of this session, but um, because I know that this committee works uh, into the very um, long hours into the night or into the session, but let me thank you very much uh, for your astuteness in recognizing the importance of this hearing. For those of us who are in a quandary, if you will, I sit on the Homeland Security Committee and spending many hours uh, in classified meetings uh, in the crypt, if you will, uh, listening to the array of threats against this country and, frankly, uh, around the world. But I may also, uh, or it comes to mind that um, if you uh, become too restrictive and you have a law that is ineffective in the espionage law, you also impact uh, what can be the modern day, uh, if you will, whistleblowers. And I know that there has been a distinction made with the Pentagon Papers, sort of an after fact reports as opposed to these documents that are current and in place. So I'd like you gentlemen to help me with the quandary that I'm in to uh, limit information, uh, limits the potential effectiveness of government. Um, but on the other hand, um, I don't know whether or not we had a hearing, Mr. Chairman, and that you, I'm sure we did, and my memory fails me, but I remember distinctly a sitting vice president uh, blowing the cover of an active duty CIA agent. And it was interesting to uh, hear the response in that instance. Uh, this person's cover was blown, and that sitting vice president uh, just uh, thought that he was uh, completely right uh, or either didn't admit it or had someone else, unfortunately, be the fall guy for it. But I think in the Judiciary Committee, it's important to really understand the law. There's some dispute. Uh, the WikiLeaks um, owner, um, leader, indicates that they did write the London ambassador uh, and sought uh, to have certain information didacted and no one responded, but there is a November 27th letter from the State Department saying don't release anything. Um, Abby, it's good to see you again. Help me with that because um, there was an effort made. I understand that um, the difficulty of um, the espionage law is knowing that you're disclosing classified information. Does it have any provision for someone who uh, try to work with the appropriate persons because I guess I see a difference of opinion. I tried to work with you. You did not want to work with me. Uh, what is the culpability? Uh, I'm going to yield to you first uh, since I, I just want to talk about the law and how does that relate to those that specific action. Very good to see you, Congressman. Mm -hmm. Let's distinguish where the law is and how it's applied versus to what people are saying could be done to improve it. So where the law is and where it applies, the elements that you are addressing goes to the following issues. When somebody is accused of violating 793 or 798 under the present Espionage Act, if they are a government employee, we've discussed the fact that they don't have the same back and forth ability to show that they had a re they did not have a reason to believe that their conduct would injure the United States or benefit an adversary or a foreign country. So in the context that you are asking and the one that this committee is addressing, which for example might be the WikiLeaks case, the outside of that sphere. Yeah. And or the one you mm -hmm. raised. So then the question is, 
the back and forth between Julian Assange to date and the other newspapers and the government officials, here's what I have, what would harm, what would you like redacted, goes to something. What it goes to is when the government prosecutes somebody in that position, that person, the government has to prove beyond reasonable doubt a certain intent. The defendant in that situation will be able to raise that kind of conduct to show that the intent was not one that had in the mind a reason to believe to injure, but was quite the opposite, that he was doing his best, recognizing what he and others would say was his First Amendment duties, to do what was right and also showing his intent was a good one. The problem is, is that this is subject to a prosecutor deciding, I'm still going to charge and let a jury decide that the intent was okay, whatever jury instructions a judge will give, and as one of the other members said, the differences between trying that case in jurisdiction one versus jurisdiction two on something that's just called intent, and I, I hope that's responsive. No, 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 it is, and I'd like uh, Professor Stone to, to take, a, uh, take a stab at that, and, and Mr. Lowell, and I don't want to call him Abby, we've worked together in the past, and um, mentioned the First Amendment rights. Do you want to give me some sense of what, where that plays a role? Sure. Well, I, I, again, I, I think that the, the government's ability to regulate the activities of its own employees who have signed secrecy agreements um, is considerable, and that that's where the focus should be, on, on keeping that information secret if it really needs to be kept secret. That once we move into the realm of public discourse, then we should be extremely careful, and the First Amendment demands that we be extremely careful. Mr. Schoenfeld a number of times has identified the Chicago Tribune incident from World War II, where the Tribune published information that revealed the fact that we were aware of a Japanese secret code, and we've been using that as a way of advancing our own war aims. And um, had that information been uh, made available to the Japanese, as it could have been given the fact that it was published, that would have been, in fact, a situation where there was a clear and imminent danger that posed a grave harm to the United States. We would have lost a pivotal, uh, a pivotal benefit in fighting World War II. And that seems to me the paradigm case for a situation where the knowing disclosure of that sort of information um, can be subject to criminal prosecution. But the key to that example is that it happens once a century. Nothing in the WikiLeaks case comes close to that. And it's important to say that's the situation where you can go after publishers or disseminators of information who are not in a special relationship to the government. And that almost never happens. And when it does happen, it merits punishment. But beyond that, we should be focusing our attention on the situation of keeping information secret in the first place, in-house, in the government, where secrecy is necessary. I like that. Mr. Stromfield, you have a different perspective, but I think um, both of us have, I think, the same goal. Um, as a member of the Homeland Security Committee, I don't fool around with potential terrorist uh, threats and or the new climate we live in. But my quandary is if we freeze down on WikiLeaks, um, we freeze down even on information that may help us in the war against terror. Uh, and I think the professor makes a very uh, definitive point. Um, I'm embarrassed that uh, the materials were accessible. How do you uh, respond uh, uh, to, the, to that idea? Well, I, uh, I agree with uh, Professor Stone that the Chicago Tribune case really is a, is a different order uh, of problem that uh, there, there would have been the kind of immediate and irreparable harm uh, that really does not flow from anything that appears in the WikiLeaks documents. But that's not to say that there is not uh, significant harm from, those, from that release. I mean, I agree with you. Uh, we are all better informed now than we were two weeks ago before those documents appeared about what our government does. There, there's no question there's a, there's a public benefit that flows from, those, from, the, from that kind of, uh, of leak. But the, however, there's, there's, there's the damage done from particular documents themselves, which we've only really begun to, to understand. We, it's, there, there, there's so many different kinds of ramifications uh, from these documents, but, but what, what, what also has happened is a, a, a single blow to the ability of the U.S. government to conduct its diplomacy in, in secret, which is a critical, a critical task for keeping the peace. If, the, if our diplomats or our foreign diplomats can't speak candidly to American government officials, we are not going to be well informed about, about what's going on abroad. Well, 
My message then is, first of all, I want our diplomats to speak candidly, and I want our government uh, to come into the world of 21st century technology so that a young uh, military personnel, 23 years old, doesn't have the ability to hack into it. They'll handle his case, and I don't think we're discussing that right now, but we do have a burden and a responsibility. You're absolutely right. The candidness, I think, is appropriate. I understand the pundits have indicated that we look good, but we don't know what else is coming. We look good because we were consistent in our cables to our basic policy. Um, that puts a smile on my face, but, but the point is, is that if lives were put in jeopardy, and again, I go back to a vice president that uh, blew the cover of a CIA agent, you know, to me, that's a direct threat on, on some individual's life. If lives have been put in jeopardy, we have a, a different, um, uh, if you will, framework to operate under. Uh, but I, y your message to me is that we now have to get more sophisticated in how we're doing. I see my time. Can I just get the last two, uh, three witnesses to comment? And uh, I think I missed Mr. Um, Mr. Mr. Wayne's time. But I'm going to go this way and then, then you, sir, if, if I could just, if you just could quickly. The dilemma, there was an inquiry, and I think uh, Mr. Lowell made it uh, clear that someone's intent is in play here. Mr. Um, Valdeck? Yeah, uh, Congresswoman, I think, I think that's right. The only thing I would add, and, and you mentioned this at the beginning of, of your questioning, is <laughs> if we're going to focus on the, the person who's doing the leaking, if we're focusing on the government employee, as I think your call to Professor Stone suggested, the other piece of this is whistleblowing. Um, and right. whether and to what extent current whistleblowing laws are adequate to provide opportunities to government employees who have come across what they think is wrongdoing to have remedies other than going to their local newspaper. Um, and with that in mind, I think it's just worth noting that I believe last Friday. Right, the new appointed person. S-372, you know, I'm not an expert on federal whistleblower laws, but I do think that recognizing that that is part of this conversation and that strengthening federal whistleblower laws, especially as they apply to the intelligence community, could actually meaningfully advance this conversation as well by reducing the number of occasions where government employees will feel the need um, or the lack of other remedies when they come across oh. wrongly classified information. Uh, uh, if you would, please. Thank you. Congresswoman, I think that's a very important caveat to what Professor Stone was saying, that the government has a lot more power to regulate the employee than it does to regulate the media. And I would add overclassification, as does uh, Gabriel Schoenfeld to that, that if we can't deal with the overclassification and we can't really protect serious whistleblowing, then I think the government is not on such solid ground on coming down hard on its own employees and regulating them in that, in that more severe way that Professor Stone says is constitutionally valid. Mr. Nader, thank you. <coughs> Welcome. Thank you for your service to this nation. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, <coughs> the point you earlier made that the disclosures by WikiLeaks uh, can actually uh, enhance our national security. It, uh, the disclosures do damage. They do damage to uh, government violations, to war crimes, to torture, to the kind of policies that inflame and expand the opposition to us by people who never had any enmity to us. And we can all cite uh, Peter Goss and General Casey and others who basically pointed that out, that our presence in these countries, if we're not careful, uh, provides fertile ground for more opposition and more uh, risk to our national security. So in that sense, uh, these leaks uh, build up public opinion and congressional engagement to hold the government's feet to the fire as a government of, under the rule of law and under constitutional standards in its foreign and military policy. Mr. Chairman has been very kind. If you can just finish and I will finish. Thank, Thank you very you. much, uh, Congresswoman. Just, if I could just associate myself with what Steve Waddick said about uh, the whistleblower laws. They're, they're a relatively new animal over the last few decades, providing protections for people who see something wrong within their agencies and, and want to disclose it. And not only do we need to make sure we have sufficient laws to protect whistleblowers and prevent retaliation, but also procedures, user-friendly procedures in those agencies so that if I'm in an agency, I see something corrupt or wrong and I want to raise it up, I, it's easy for me to do so. I don't have to worry about retaliation. That's important because obviously if you have the law and the procedures in place that make it easy and seamless to do that, then there's no reason that person needs to go to the press. So in addition to looking at the laws, any oversight that looks at the agencies, especially the intelligence community, to ensure that it is easy for people to blow the whistle without fear, I think would be, uh, be useful. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, uh, just to you, Mr. Chairman, this is a bipartisan hearing, and I just simply want to say maybe as we go into the next session, in a bipartisan way, we can look at whistleblower, or as you well know, the No Fear Act uh, that uh, needs to be, which has to do with protecting uh, government employees against uh, whistleblower comments, and I hope we'll do that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The chair recognizes the ranking member of the court's subcommittee of this committee, the gentleman from North Carolina, Howard Colville. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want to commend the panelists for their durability today. They've hung tough with us, <laughs> and I appreciate that. Mr. Weinstein, you mentioned the possibility of enacting a provision to prohibit the disclosure of classified information by government employees, regardless of the damage to national security. What are the pros and cons accompanying such a statute? And do we run the risk of inviting more classification than currently exists in an effort to prevent dissemination of, say, unsavory, but not necessarily damaging material? That, that's a very good question, sir. And um, that actually harks back to something that, that Abby Lowell mentioned about um, how back in 2000 there was a, that statute was passed, actually, and then the President Clinton vetoed it, and the statute basically said, if you're a government employee, you sign that dis non-disclosure agreement and you disclose classified information, something that's so secret, then you're guilty. The pro is that that's very clean. You don't have to show damage. You don't have to get into this back and forth of whether this it was damaging to disclose secrets about the Iraq war or good because the Iraq war needed to be examined more closely. It's just clear. You have a responsibility as a government employee to protect classified information. You willingly and knowingly disclose it. You're guilty. So that's the, on the pro side. The con side, of course, is that, as you pointed out, there's so much information that's classified that it would, it would be uh, chilling to many government employees when they're going to talk to people that, gee, all it takes is one step over the line and I yeah. get into one iota of classified information and I'm guilty. Uh, you know, I, I, if I intentionally disclose that, I can't talk about anything. And so one of the cons is that, you know, it'll end up, people will be scared to talk to the press, people will be scared to talk to Congress because they're worried that they're gonna trip over classified information. And you might have people who will be prosecuted for information which, though classified, as you pointed out, might not really be all that sensitive. It might just be either a matter of uh, mistaken over classification or something which is embarrassing but not really s sensitive. Uh, I'll, I'll thank you for that, sir. Mr. Schoenfeld, it is, is it your belief that the First Amendment confers on journalists an absolute right to publish classified information or government secrets? No, it is not. And I think, uh, for what I've heard on the panel, there's some agreement with me that under some circumstances, journalists can be prosecuted under the espionage statutes. And the Chicago, to, to, to hark back to the Chicago Tribune case, we have a case where uh, I think the espionage statutes would, would apply if uh, a story came out that cost the lives of tens of thousands of U.S. servicemen and prolonged the war. Uh, so I think, th and the Supreme Court, of course, in, in the uh, Pentagon Papers case, uh, five of the nine justices I had noted earlier did suggest that if a case came to them, not as a prior restraint case, but after the fact, as, a, as an Espionage Act for prosecution or a Section 798 prosecution, they would strongly consider uh, upholding a conviction if the material at issue was the material that was that Congress had indeed prescribed under under the under those statutes. I got you. Thank you, sir. Professor Stone, we touched on this, but let me run it by you again. Does WikiLeaks enjoy the same protections as traditional journalism organizations? A and in the internet age, how do we distinguish between tradi traditional media and the new media? And does the law contemplate such distinction? Um, I, I think realistically, it's impossible to do that. Um, the Supreme Court itself, in interpreting the First Amendment, has always refused to define who the press is. Uh, and in any event, uh, the speech clause, has been, as has been noted, is an independent protection. So although that may be frustrating, I think as a, as a practical reality, there's no way to distinguish WikiLeaks from the New York Times or from a blogger. Um, it, they're all part of the freedom of speech that the First Amendment protects. And um, now that doesn't mean that, that the conduct that they engaged in, 
may not be treated differently depending upon what they actually do but i think in terms of the nature of the institutions or individuals as a practical matter that's that's not going to be a sustainable line of inquiry thanks and thank you gentlemen for being with us today but i yield back mr chairman thank you mr coble i now turn to bill delahunt the distinguished gentleman from massachusetts well thank you mr chairman <clears throat> and this has been a very informative uh, discussion and we're talking about legislation and and uh, you know the problems that that uh, of drafting appropriate language and the issues of intent, et cetera. But I, I still go back to what I said initially. Uh, until Congress, and particularly members of of this committee, address the issue of the classification process, we're operating in the dark. We don't understand the classification process. I wonder if anyone on the panel really does in terms of the steps. Who classifies? I've heard some of you use the term improper classification. Who makes that decision? I've heard the term authorized leaks. What in the hell is an <laughs> authorized leak? Is that a leak that, you know, a someone in the administration can do, but we can't? I've, what struck me, again, when I chaired the Oversight Committee in Foreign Affairs was we would get material uh, that was redacted page after page after page after page. All you knew or all you saw was the number. And then, of course, the next day you'd read in the newspapers, but I guess that was a good leak as opposed to a bad leak. So I, I hope, and I, I would direct this to my, my colleague from Iowa, I hope with the new Congress that Congress conducts a series of hearings where it demands an explanation of the process itself. Are we going to rely on a bureaucrat, you know, at a, at, at a lower level to do the redaction? Who does all this? Help me with the mystery. Does, can you, anyone here? Maybe I see you, Abby, nodding your head. Give it a shot. I can't answer that question as a blanket fashion across all agencies and all parts of the Department of Defense and all places in the world. But I can answer it based on the materials I've seen on the cases I've litigated, and you're raising a point. So in the APAC lobbyist case, by the time we were done and getting ready for trial, there was no fewer than, I don't know, four or 5,000 pieces of paper that were in a classification mode at one level or another. There's an executive order which has criterion for, criteria for why something's classified, very specific categories of the potential harm that it, the release of that document or information could cause. Like every other thing you've been talking about today, those aren't microscopic definitions in a mathematical way. Mm -hmm. They are subjective to begin with. One, for example, talks about interference with the nation's foreign policy or foreign relations or relations with a foreign country. I mean, what interference? What does that mean? Well, I mean, but then the second question is who gets to decide, you've asked. That's the key. Well, in many agencies, what you'll find is that it's not just not the secretary or the deputy or the assistant secretary or its equivalent. It is the lowest level of person working on the subject who at the end of every day. But that's my concern. Well, it, that's, that's my concern. It and I think that issue is the predicate for addressing the concerns that you as a panel have, have addressed. You've got to begin there. And we really have to do a thorough review because I can, I would testify in the next Congress that as chair of that committee, I saw material that was classified that was, it was absurd that it was classified. And we're just building up a, a backlog of classified information that 
ought to be, that everyone in this room today would concur ought to be in the public domain. The concern that I have is not so much about WikiLeaks, but what we're not having access to in a democracy. And I, again, uh, I hope that in, in the future it's addressed, whether it's in this committee or the, any committee, maybe a select committee is actually needed. And people coming in who, who actually do the classification, not the secretary, not the head of the agency, but to hear it. Now, I had occasion working with Congressman Lundgren where we had concerns about information that was being disseminated um, from the FBI. Um, it was very revealing in terms of how it was done. And I'm not saying it was, the classification was done in good faith, but it clearly did not, in my judgment, meet any kind of standard in terms of classification. That's got to be reviewed. Mr. Blanton. You've got a couple of great assets at your disposal for the next session. There is a terrific review board called the Public Interest Declassification Board headed by Marty Faga, former head of the National Reconnaissance Office. There's a group of smart people who are looking exactly at these questions. Right. How do you change it on the front end so you don't, because every single classification decision that a lowly bureaucrat makes generates a stream of cost to the taxpayers right. and to the efficient flow of information that goes on indefinitely until somebody like me asks for that document to get released. That's a terrible way to do business. It should be automatic after you know, a certain sunset on every one of these secrets. You can call in those public interest D-class board folks. They can give you some expertise. There's a wonderful little office called the Information Security Oversight Office. Those are the folks that audit the secrecy system. They're smart. The head of that office is the guy who coined the, the term Wikimania that I've been using today in my statement. Call them in and give them some more resources. I think they got 29 people to ride herd on this massive overclassified security system. They need some help. Uh, but they can guide you through how does the stamp get made. And the last thing I would ask, Mr. Chairman, we've done about four different postings that support the consensus on the committee of massive overclassification. Congressman Poe commented on it, agreed with Congressman Delahunt, actually. It seems that they actually agreed on this. This is actually a piece of White House email. It was declassified uh, by, uh, in a process one week apart. And the first time they cut out the middle, blacked it out. And the second time they cut out the top and the bottom. You slide them together, you got the whole thing. And the punchline is, it was the same reviewer, a senior reviewer with 25 years experience. Called him up, said, what's up with that? He said, oh, it must have been something in the paper about Egypt that week, but Libya this week. I mean, that's the level of subjectivity. Exactly. We've got about five or six web postings of these kinds of graphic illustrations of the overclassification problem that will help you get your arms around it, and I hope do something about it. Uh, who authorizes the leaks, by the way? In there, there's that famous quote from uh, James Baker, the former Secretary of State under President George H.W. Bush. He said, you know, the ship of state is a very unusual ship. It's the only one that leaks from the top. <laughs> and uh, I think Daniel Shore once commented when David Gergen was brought into the Bush White House, well, you know, Jim Baker was too busy leaking at the high level. He needs somebody to leak at the mid-level, <laughs> right? Well, you know, what, what, what's... What I find ironic, of course, is the umbrage that some will take about some leaks. Um, but I guess it's not their leaks. No. There are good leaks and bad leaks, I guess, is the bottom line. Mm. Mr. Nader? Congressman, part of this uh, goes back to the integrity of the civil servant and protecting it and letting civil servants and people who work in the armed forces in the executive branch uh, take their conscience to work. And if you look at the civil service oath of office, it is not to the cabinet secretary. It is not to the president. It's to the highest moral standards. And a lot of this idiocy and overclassification comes from the lack of internal self-confidence that they will have some reasonable protection by civil f servants who would say, this is foolish to do this. And I'll just leave you one example, 40 years ago, one agency of the government wanted to get from the U.S. Navy the, the amount of water pollution coming out of naval bases. And the Navy denied uh, the then agency dealing with water pollution, they denied the disclosure of the volume of sewage going into the ocean on the grounds that 
the Chinese or the Soviet could use that information in order to determine how many sailors were on the base. Now that, that is a level of foolishness that could have been nipped in the bud if we supported our civil servants and, and basically recognize that this is overall a struggle between individual conscience of people up against the organizational machines that we call bureaucracy. And we always should bring back the civil service oath of office. Very short, very compelling. They all have to take it. We should protect them in making sure that it can be implemented in their daily work. Thank you very much. Uh, your additional time was granted uh, at, at the leave of uh, Steve King of Iowa. We now turn to the distinguished gentleman from Arizona, Trent Franks. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. I appreciate all of you folks being here. Um, challenging subject this morning. I think it's uh, obvious it to me, perhaps to all of us, that no human being, regardless of their education or training, is really competent to opine or, or to know the full extent uh, of the actual damage that a leak like WikiLeaks could cause. I mean, I, I guess you could put a team of experts together to try to assess the future and the, the potential undetermined damage, and, and I just think that it would be completely a hopeless endeavor. So I'm convinced, obviously, that Julian Assange cannot possibly be able to to uh, project what uh, the potential damage of what he did is all about. And that's a, a, a significant point. But in light of that obvious truth, it, I'm wondering if it's time perhaps for us to rewrite our statutes to establish some sort of lower burden uh, for the prosecutor when it comes to proving the likelihood that a leak could cause uh, actual damage and the necessary level of intent uh, under the statute itself. Um, Mr. Schoenfeld, you, you mentioned in your testimony that the ill effects of information leaks can sometimes take you know, years to manifest. And you, you mentioned Pearl, Pearl Harbor and the book, uh, The American Black Chamber, uh, as an example, which I think is a brilliant example, um, where the, the uh, book uh, disclosed uh, uh, certain things that perhaps could have prevented Pearl Harbor. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to get you to e expand on that a little bit. Uh, and that, uh, uh, you know, our, our government, I understand, actually considered prosecuting uh, the author of that book, uh, but felt like the prosecution, the public nature of it might to enlighten Japan even more than what the book did. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that you can describe what might have seemed to the outside observer to be the unforeseen consequences of the leaks through the book. And uh, if hypothetically the author of the American Black Chamber were to be a uh, tried criminally for disclosing intelligence information today, uh, what level of, of mens rea do you think a prosecutor would be able to show in this case? And um, I mean, I guess purpose, purposeful or malicious intent to aid in the bombing of Pearl Harbor would not be one of them. Uh, that probably would be too, a little too strong. But what about perhaps just recklessness? Uh, I know it's difficult to show malicious intent, uh, but yet the devastation that was caused at Pearl Harbor, you know, my last memory of that reading the, the, the numbers on that war is 50 million dead. Uh, it was kind of a big deal, the whole war. And um, so in light of this, do you think that we should can reconsider the mens rea elements of our espionage statutes? And I've given you a complicated question there. Tell us about Black Chamber. Tell us uh, how it all um, fits and how do you think that we would uh, approach that today? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Congressman, for that very interesting question. Uh, Herbert O. Yardley was, a, was probably America's leading cryptographer in the 1920s. Uh, he was put out of his job uh, after Secretary of State uh, Simpson said, gentlemen, don't read other gentlemen's mail. Uh, fell in hard times in the Depression and wrote a book called The American Black Chamber. Basically wrote it to make a pile of money. He laid bare in that book the full history of American code breaking efforts, including the, uh, our successes in the Washington Naval Conference of 1921 where we broke the Japanese diplomatic codes and were able to outfox them in those negotiations. When that book came out, it was treated uh, much like uh, Eric Lichtblaut reg regarded his own story in the Times as a kind of interesting yarn. Highly entertaining was what some American newspapers said about it. But in Japan, it caused uh, an absolute furor about the, uh, it, the laxity with which their own government had treated uh, their codes and ciphers. And it led the Japanese government over the course of the 1930s to invest heavily in additional code security. And they developed the purple machine 
which was nearly unbreakable. And, it, and one of the consequences was that it delayed the, um, the it, it slowed down the pace at which we, our, co our resurrected code breaking effort, could read Japanese cables. And we were, we were somewhat behind when Pearl Harbor came along and we missed crucial signals that uh, Pearl Harbor was the intended uh, destination of the Japanese attack. Now, uh, if Yardley were to be prosecuted today, uh, it would be uh, not a hard case because the intent provisions of Section 798, which govern uh, communications intelligence, are very clear. They're basically the act, it's one of those unusual provisions in American law where the act itself is the crime without an intent provision, as far as I, as I remember. Uh, and so, uh, uh, I mean, there might be a, a constitutional challenge, uh, but uh, the statute itself does not have an intent requirement. As for relaxing the intent standard for the Espionage Act, I, overall, very cautious about changing this act in any way. I mean, I think Congress should move very slowly. Uh, widening it has real costs. Uh, tightening it uh, is <laughs> has other costs. So. Uh, uh, I don't have a, I don't have an answer, but I think I think uh, hearings like this with with, uh, with with attorneys, and I'm not an attorney who who worked closely with the act, uh, very much in order. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. My my time is up, but I really want you to know I appreciate the response, and I, I hope it kind of puts things in perspective here. Um, sometimes there's no way to uh, possibly anticipate what certain leaks can cause, and in this case, it uh, really caused Japan to completely rewrite reassess their codes and, and, and potentially could have prevented Pearl Harbor. And uh, in the 9-1 world that we live in, um, it's, a, it's a relevant consideration. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Could, could I uh, uh, thank, thank you very much, Trent. Uh, but Professor Stone wanted to get one comment in about your question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I think it's very important not to get fixated on this question of does the speech cause some harm. One of the things that the Supreme Court figured out pretty quickly is that almost all speech causes harm. It's not harmless. And so it made a terrible mistake during World War I, which is that it took the position that because criticism of the war would undermine the morale of the American people, it might lead people to refuse to uh, uh, except induction, induction into the military, that that speech could be punished because it might have a harm. And what they figured out pretty quickly after that is that was a disaster. That you can't prohibit speech that criticizes an ongoing war because it might have harm. Speech does have harm. And the Pentagon Papers case, although the court said there was not likely an imminent grave harm, even Justice Stewart conceded the speech was harmful. Certainly we were revealing all sorts of confidential information about the past, that we had double deal with respect to some of our allies, that we'd made uh, alliances that hadn't been publicly disclosed before, that made it more difficult for us to negotiate in the future. If the standard focuses on harm generally, then you've given up the First Amendment. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we thank Trent Franks for raising this the line of dis discussion. I, I turn now to uh, my good friend, uh, the chairman of the court subcommittee, Hank Johnson of Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Uh, chairman, for holding this very important uh, hearing. Thank you, panelists, for bearing through it. Um, before I ask a few questions, I'd like to respectfully remind my colleagues that the WikiLeaks organization and Mr. Julian Assange are publishers. Now, if it can be shown that they um, in some way aided and abetted in the perpetration of a, or commission of a, of a crime, or if they were parties to a crime, um, then they could be subject to prosecution. Uh, but the Justice Department has yet to come forward with uh, uh, an indictment and, uh, and until and unless uh, an indictment uh, is issued, then, uh, and, and until there is a trial uh, on an indictment, then Mr. Asanji is entitled to a presumption of innocence by law, um, and uh, his guilt 
would have to be proved by a, uh, uh, there would have to be proof beyond a reasonable doubt before that cloak of, uh, of innocence, that presumption of innocence could be removed from him. Uh, so first I would like to, uh, to, to just settle us down and uh, let us uh, let us look at this situation uh, through that lens. We do have constitutional rights, among which is uh, uh, a right to speak freely and a right to publish uh, First Amendment. Um, and I'd also like to point out the fact that uh, all of the documents uh, that w were made available to WikiLeaks are not all classified. Um, some are classified, and, um, but there have, been, um, uh, there have been indications from Secretary uh, Robert Gates that uh, these, the releases thus far uh, have not significantly harmed overall U.S. interests. Uh, and a quote from Secretary Gates uh, is as follows. The fact is governments deal with the United States because it is in their interest, not because they like us, not because they trust us, and not because they think we can keep secrets. And so while there is a public furor about the release of uh, the documents and the information contained therein having been uh, disclosed to the public, uh, we must not get carried away in a fervor uh, as to uh, what has actually occurred. Now, if these uh, leaks, and, and I assume that they do, undermine national security, and the ability of American diplomats to do their jobs, um, and American personnel who uh, uh, who actually engage in uh, in compromising uh, this uh, classified information should be uh, prosecuted and should be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. But unless those criminal allegations are proven, let's be careful and let's uh, insist on that presumption of innocence. Um, now, the New York Times is also publishing this information. Uh, and we aren't shutting down their website or encouraging an international manhunt for its editors. And. Uh, we, we cannot allow whatever outrage that we may have, whether or not it be justified or not, uh, to cloud our judgment about our fundamental uh, right to a freedom of the press. And, uh, you know, now we, we've, uh, we've got to acknowledge that more than just the publishing of this material, this is actually a, uh, a failure of the U.S. to protect its material. After all, it's a, uh, a private first class who is alleged to have had access to this treasure trove of information and the ability to uh, download it. Primarily, it's our fault that this information was released. And we need to, uh, and, and if there is a service, or, or if there is a positive uh, uh, twist on what uh, has occurred, uh, it is that we've been made aware of, uh, of a softness in our protection of our important uh, information. And therefore, we, uh, we now, because of public uh, uh, disclosure, we're now in a position to correct uh, and make uh, safer and more fail-proof our information. Uh, so for that, uh, I would have to thank Mr. Uh, Assange.
for that public service. Um, now, the, uh, uh, we certainly should do a better job uh, of protection instead of uh, uh, embarking upon a um, uh, crusade to harass and um, even prosecute uh, publishers of information. Um, and I trust that our Justice Department uh, will look very carefully uh, at this case and the chilling effect that a uh, prosecution that is unwarranted uh, could have on our ability to, uh, to enjoy our First Amendment freedoms in this country. Um, the administration has directed federal agencies to prohibit their employees from accessing WikiLeaks documents on their work computers. It has also been reported that a State Department employee and alumnus of Columbia Uni University School of International and Public Affairs has warned school officials that students interested in a diplomatic career should not access uh, the documents, even from their home computers. Uh, if I may ask Mr. Blanton and Mr. Nader, uh, what are your thoughts about this? And, uh, and censorship-free internet access has been a priority for us as we have dealt with other countries, particularly uh, China. And uh, we encourage them to open up to have uh, uh, free internet or, or freedom of internet access. And um, do you see uh, where our current stance uh, could be, um, could place us in an untenable position as far as assuming a moral high ground uh, for making those kinds of arguments to uh, those around the world who don't enjoy the same freedom as we do. Um, Mr. Blanton and then Mr. Nader. Mr. Congressman, that wonderful example from Columbia University, I think the best answer to that came from a professor there named Gary Sick, who was a career Navy officer and served on the National Security Council staff under Presidents Ford, Carter, and Reagan. Professor Six stood up at, I think, an open uh, meeting at Columbia and said, if there's any student of international affairs who is not reading the WikiLeaks cables, then they should be thrown out of the profession because this is essential information. The Air Force is doing this. This is silly. The Air Force is essentially restricting its own open source information gathering. The Library of Congress is stopping the WikiLeaks site. This is just silly. It's self-defeating. It's foolish. I'm sure it will end. Um, it doesn't get us anywhere. And there's a, the larger question you're, you're going to, and I think this is where the slippery slope that uh, Mr. Schoenfeld was talking about, he thought the, the act should apply to foreigners. Well, I have to say, on our website, the National Security Archive, we published the transcripts of Mao Zedong's meetings with Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger. That's top secret information in China. That would certainly be subject to their Espionage Act. So they get a right to come prosecute me on that basis, I'm sorry, I don't think so. I think we should look at limiting our own laws and trying to move to a different kind of standard about what transparency we can bring about in governments worldwide. Well, I think those recommendations, Congressman, were, first of all, futile. They can't enforce it. And chilling and induces uh, not the best type of conscientious civil servant or foreign service officer uh, that these students should aspire to. The second point is on China is very well put. I think Hillary Clinton is not uh, presently recalling her remarks when she, in effect, uh, if anything, uh, lauded the uh, hacksters in China for breaking through Chinese government censorship on the internet. And uh, as you I implied, uh, we can't we can't lecture the world uh, on in one direction and then start engaging in a kind of suppressive activity uh, in our country. Uh, Hillary Clinton it would be a very good witness before this committee next year to explain not only uh, what she perceives as uh, 
uh, as the uh, freedom of Chinese hackers compared to other hackers, but also uh, how she has, in effect, done what Secretary Gates has done, which has downplayed the importance in terms of the damage and risk of uh, the release of these State Department uh, cables. The more Gates and Clinton downplay this, it seems the stronger case uh, Julian Assange has for what he's done. Let me ask if anybody sees any benefit uh, that has uh, accrued from this uh, unauthorized disclosure of documents, of confidential documents, some of which are secret. I mean, I think, I, Congressman, I think there are, there are unquestionably benefits, but as Professor Stone mentioned uh, a few moments ago, there's also always harm, right? I mean, I think the- Well, and, and, and we've talked about the harm. I just want to talk about no, the I, benefits. No, I, I take the point. And I think, I mean, I think there's, you know, it, it's hard to dispute that um, having access, having public access to information that wasn't in the public domain and that should have been, um, is always a positive thing that, you know, to use the old aphorism, sunshine is the best disinfectant. Um, you know, I, I don't think the question is whether there's a benefit. I think that seems pretty clear. Anyone else? Okay. One quick thing is this, this is a benefit. This is a clear benefit from these events because it's allowing Congress to sift through again a hundred year old statute to ensure that it's still working the way it should is against all the other values that we have. So in that sense, it has sponsored this kind of public discourse and we are the better for it, I think. Well, we have some amongst us uh, here in Congress who feel that government is the problem. Government is, as soon as it starts putting its hand in things, uh, then everything goes haywire. Uh, so, uh, I don't know how we resolve that, uh, that basic conflict, <coughs> although I guess those folks who would say that uh, the government gets in the way are confining their objections to, um, in, to a commercial context and not a security context, uh, but it is still ironic. Uh, that uh, that would be those who would uh, chip away at uh, and uh, really hack away at our right to free speech um, and a free press, uh, while at the same time uh, uh, want get government to get out of the uh, regulatory business with respect to commercial activities. So, with that, I will. Uh, I will uh, yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome, Chairman and, uh, Jackson. And would note that uh, not many are around uh, to uh, listen to my comments. <laughs> the chair is now pleased to recognize Judge Charles Gonzalez of Texas. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Lowell, thank you very much for characterizing the hearing of the United States Congress as something that's beneficial that hasn't been the most popular statements uh, in reference to what we've been doing, but thank you. Uh, first question is, uh, whatever we do here does have implications uh, for matters that are really the jurisdiction of other committees, but very important, and I think you all recognize this. So I would want a yes or no from each of the witnesses, because we are talking about the conduit. We're talking about the recipient of the information uh, that's been provided them. Would you agree, with, well, yes or no, is the Amazon cloud server a recipient? Is an internet service provider a recipient? And Dean Stone, it just, you know, yes or no, I mean. Yes, but it's unconstitutional. Yes, but what? It's unconstitutional. What's unconstitutional? To treat it as a recipient okay. for purposes of criminal liability. That they would be the, the conduit, the medium, is a recipient. Uh, under a uh, literal definition, I would say yes, but I would say it's moot because it would be unconstitutional okay. to apply it that way. Mr. Lowe? 
Yes, they are a recipient. The statute will apply once they redisclose. Not you're, it's not a crime to receive. It's a crime to retransmit, which they're doing by allowing people onto their site. And like Professor, I think such an application would be a gross over application and unconstitutional. Mr. Weinstein. Yes, um, yes, Congressman. I, it would be a recipient, and I guess it could fall within the statute, but it. Um, very unlikely I, anybody would ever want to prosecute it, and it w you would have to await. While there is a provision that says if you retain and do not tell, re return the information to the, to the government, under certain circumstances, an entity could be prosecuted. Um, very unlikely that this uh, such entity would be prosecuted, even if it tur in turn um, distributed beyond the service. Mr. Schoenfeld. Uh, yes, I, it, it is a recipient. Uh, I agree with. Uh, Mr. Weinstein, that it's uh, very unlikely that any prosecutor would ever tackle it. And there, there are so many other more blatant leaks that have not been prosecuted. That one seems really okay. a stretch. Mr. Valdez? Uh, yes, I would just echo Mr. Weinstein's point. I think the key is the retention provision of the Espionage Act. I think the government would far c more quickly prosecute for retention than for publication. Um, and I think that's where you would see the constitutional problems that Mr. Lowell and Professor Stone alluded to. Come on, Mr. Blanton. Disagree. Yes, but should never be prosecuted. Just never. Mr. Nader? No, it's a conduit contractor. See, so yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Mr. Nader. I, I just, it has huge implications, unbelievable implications, because then I really think you need to prosecute the person that provided the ink for the newspaper, the person that provided the paper for the newspaper. Why aren't we doing that? And you're saying that it's unlikely. But crazy things happen. Crazy things happen when people are scared and there's fear out there. So uh, this question will go to Mr. Lowell. And uh, let's see who else. Um, it's going to be Mr. Valdeck. You all have given us certain suggestions, and I think they're excellent. And it all comes down to what I think have been basic principles all along, and that's intent. So let's say we tighten up how we classify information. And we find this formula, and we find the arbiter. We've got the criteria. It's tightened down. It's legitimately classified. And then someone violates their oath. That's easy. I mean, that person's going to be persecuted and should be, or prosecuted and persecuted, likely. Um, and that happens. But now we go to that person that receives the information. And you say that. Listen, Mr. Lowell, I think you had introduced a clear and precise specific intent requirement, or that's Mr. Valdeck, Mr. Lowell, carefully define espionage, intent to injure the United States. How do you define specific intent? Well, you just, you can't say, well, I, I saw it and anyone would, knows that this is, could be injurious to the legitimate interests of the United States, or do you start having something at that point in time that, you should assume, a reasonable person should assume these things. How do you, is it just the traditional principles that we always apply? Because uh, I understand, I think you're onto something and that you still have to have the intent, but I've never had, I don't recall someone acknowledging that they intended to do certain things when their whole defense is that they're not culpable because they never had that intent. So we end up back on the intent question well, either Congress will end up in the intent or the courts will end up with the intent issue. And when both of them do, they'll look to various things that are, as you pointed out, true in every criminal case. They'll look to see what a person accused intent by a person's statements, the context in which they acted, and the circumstantial evidence. If a government employee sees that their immediate boss is talking to the press about a topic, that person may have a good faith belief that that's okay to talk about, even if it includes classified information. If a recipient is acting in context of his or her job as a lobbyist or as a member of the press or even in a free speech context and hears something and retransmits it because there's nothing that indicates that it is of any particular damage and it's part of the person's job, it goes to that person's intent. If the person sees that they are operating overtly and not covertly, they're not stealing information, they didn't pay for it, they didn't bribe anybody for it, then there's, an, uh, there's evidence of their intent. The issues of bad faith and good faith apply in almost every criminal prosecution in a white collar context. This is no different. It will just be unique as to what will show the good or bad faith. 
you spelled it. I really don't have anything to add. Uh, I think I think that's exactly right. I think the the only the only piece that I might tack on at the very end is whether there would be circumstances where we would also want to include recklessness. Um, you know, um, where, where where we might also where 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 we might allow for prosecution short of the showing of specific intent if we can show that the defendant acted completely recklessly and without regard for any of the safeguards that are built into the statute. But I otherwise totally agree with Mr. Lowell. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I do one last observation, and that is uh, yeah, when we all went to law school, we remember uh, times of war, the law is silent. Remember that? The Constitution is not a, a suicide pact. The problem in today's uh, world is that wars are indefinite. Wars are open-ended. Wars are not even declared. And that's what really is probably one of the greatest problems for us is uh, what's, I guess, the new normal out here. Thank you very much, and I yield back. I want to thank uh, you very much, Judge Gonzalez, for your concluding uh, the questions in this hearing. Uh, this hearing has a certain poignancy because it may be our final hearing in the 111th Congress, but uh, we're, we may be coming back next week, Bob, and so I can't be conclusive in, to, in assuring you that this will be my last hearing as chair. Well, Mr. Chairman, if, if you come back, I'll, I'll come back too. And if, if you'll yield, I, I would like to say that, uh, well, it is indefinite exactly how much longer uh, we'll be able to call you Mr. Chairman in the official cap capacity. You'll always be Mr. Chairman to all of us. You've done a great job as chairman of this Thanks committee. Thanks so and much. Very fair to the minority, so we, we look forward to reciprocating next year. Thank you so much, and uh, I, I want to say to these seven gentlemen that have been with us since early this morning, uh, this may be, uh, in fact, uh, for me personally, one of the most uh, important hearings that the committee has undertaken, uh, and I am already talking with Mr. Goodlatte uh, about the possibility of uh, subsequent hearings on the same subject in the 112th Congress. And so we thank you uh, as, as sincerely as all of us can and uh, declare these hearings adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, thank you all.